analysis. And I kind of told you guys wrong. This week we're actually going to be doing, we're going to be looking at pre-understanding, what do we bring to the text, and then we're also going to be looking at um, the five-step interpret interpretive journey, the method that I use and that I, I think is a really good method to use, very consistent way to interpret scripture. And you can use this method, uh, and we will use it on any genre in scripture. So that's one of the things I really like about it. So uh, next week we'll cover gospels and letters. What are the special rules for interpreting those and how can we use the method we're going to learn today on those? And then the week after that, we're going to learn about poetry and apocalyptic literature. How do we interpret that? And so, uh, okay, well, with that, let's go ahead and get started. So we as readers uh, of the Bible, we're, we're by no means neutral, right? Or uh, we bring a lot of preconceived notions and influences with us to the text when we read. And I think a really good illustration of this is a story. And so Danny and his family uh, are spending several years at working in Ethiopia as missionaries. And Danny is privileged enough to be able to watch a Christmas pageant uh, presented by the Ethiopian church. And, you know, Christmas pageants typically in America here, they're pretty st stereotypical, right? Danny assumed that this one in Ethiopia would be likewise, would be the same. How else can you really tell the story, right? Well, he was in for a big shock because as the pageant started, it started out normal enough. There's a town crier announcing the census uh, and all of that. But here's where the story gets a little bit different. Uh, Joseph and Mary did not travel alone. Mary, quite big in her last month of pregnancy, was accompanied by over a dozen aunts and female cousins. Joseph walked alone in front, followed by all of these women who were chatting, chatting giggling merrily about babies and motherly things. Whoa, Danny thought, what happened to the typical travel scene with Mary, Joseph, and the donkey? Where did all these women come from? They're not in the story. A few minutes later, they settle into Bethlehem, and Mary uh, start, starts into labor, and Joseph paces nervously back and forth in front of the, the stable, while the women, several of them, midwives, crowded around Mary to help deliver the baby. A short labor ensued, and soon the women all gave a high, sh uh, shrill, vibrating cry, the typical Ethiopian joy cry that announces the birth of every child in Ethiopia. So... And then the rest of the, the pageant takes about two hours. The rest of it was normal. But what really struck Danny was the way in which the Ethiopians had interpreted the story through their culture. Okay, they were not trying to, they were not consciously doing this, right? This was kind of something that they were doing subconsciously. They were trying to portray the story as they thought it actually happened. And you notice what they did. It's the same thing that we do in our pageants is we fill in the gaps of the story with explanations that made sense in their culture. And so, for example, to Ethiopians, uh, it is unthinkable that Mary's family would allow her to make this trip alone, right? She was a young woman expecting her first baby, and uh, an Ethiopian could not imagine her making this journey with only Joseph, a newlywed, you know, young guy. I mean, who's going to deliver the baby, right? Uh, we don't even actually, typically in America, we don't even think about uh, midwives, right? Because we have doctors and hospitals. We're, we're comfortable with kind of this idea of, or this scene of a, a husband or a couple go rushing off to the hospital, and then presto, a baby appears, right? We don't even think about midwives uh, or anything like that. But um, we have to be careful about this because um, we tend to bring our culture into the text when we're reading. And the culture isn't a bad thing. It can sometimes be a helpful thing. But uh, it can, it, unfortunately, in most, ti most times it's just not. Uh, but, you know, when you're thinking about it, though, who actually has the more correct you know, visualization of this narrative. Is it us in America or is it the Ethiopians? Probably the Ethiopians, right? Because there had to be midwives, right? I mean, they're just, to think that Joseph would double as an obstetrician, you know, is kind of ridiculous or whatever, but um, especially, but anyway, so pre-understanding refers to all of these preconceived notions and understandings that we bring to the text, which have been formulated both consciously and subconsciously before we actually study the text. And so uh, one of the dangers that comes with pre-understanding is pride, right? And I love this quote that says, pride encourages us to think that we have got the correct meaning before we've made the appropriate effort to recover it. Pride does not listen, it knows. So another dangerous aspect of pre-understanding surfaces when we come to the text with a theological agenda, okay? So a theological agenda means that we start into the text with a specific slant that we're looking for, and we use the text merely to search for the details that fit into our agenda, so Van Hooser humorously calls this uh, overstanding rather than understanding, as if we're, we're standing over the Word of God trying to interpret what it means instead of standing under the Word of God and letting the author that penned it uh, determine that what the text means. I think that's a really good way to, to, to kind of visualize that. Another danger with pre-understanding is uh, familiarity. So familiarity is a danger because if 
we're thoroughly familiar with the passage, we tend to think that we know all that there is, right? I know I find myself, uh, when I, I teach a lot of the same lessons uh, to the youth, I, I am prone to, to skip over certain lessons that I'm familiar with because I think I've, I've studied it, I've, I've gotten all that there is to get. But as we learned in the first session, right, passages actually have a lot of depth to them when we were looking at observations, right? And we're unlikely to grasp all that there is from that text in just one pass-through or just a few pass-throughs. So we have to resist the temptation to let, uh, just because we're familiar with the text, to let that uh, kind of turn our pre-understanding into pride. Another danger with pre-understanding is cultural baggage. So uh, cultural baggage expects Scripture to fit the prevailing mindset that the way of life uh, as dictated by our culture at large. So, you know, the Bible tells us we should think, what should Jesus do, right? But our culture, um, our theology, you know, may tell us what would Jesus do, but our culture tells us what would Jason Bourne do, right? Or what would Chuck Dort, Chuck Dort, Chuck Norris do? Uh, for example, even though we believe that Jesus is Lord, our Lord and Savior, when he tells us to turn the other cheek, a voice in the back of our heads objects, right? Uh, after all, turning the cheek is not the, really the American way, right? It's certainly not something Jason Bourne would do or Chuck Norris would do. I mean, maybe he would turn his cheek just to let the enemy hit him a second time, but then after that, he'd thrash the guy, right? I mean, and when you think about it, none of our heroes in our culture today even uh, would turn the other cheek, right? The Jedis wouldn't do it. Tony Stark wouldn't do it. Whoever uh, it is that you kind of look up to. And so when we read this command from Jesus to turn the other cheek, we immediately interpret it in such a way that it does not conflict with our cultural norms, especially our cultural he- heroes, right? So this, predis- this cultural-driven predisposition is what we call cultural baggage. So kind of imagine this. Imagine you're going on a journey, because soon we're about to go on a journey. We're going to go on the interpretive journey. And you're going on a long hike through the mountains on a hot day. You wear good hiking boots, a hat, you bring sunglasses, and a canteen, right? Should you bring three or four suitcases with you? No, right? That'd be ridiculous. I mean, imagine that. Can you imagine hulking through the mountains with one suitcase under each arm? You know, uh, well, if we're not careful, our culture will likewise, likewise weigh us down on the interpretive journey because our culture tends to make us skew how we read the text, like the example with the Ethiopian Christmas play. And it does this subconsciously. And just a few examples of this. Uh, how many of you have seen uh, Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? How, m- how many of you, when you think of, of the Ark of the Covenant or even scenes from it or someone touching it or anything, you just, your mind goes back to this scene. I don't know. It does for me at least. But uh, that, can, that can heavily influence how we think about the Ark of the Covenant or even, so things from film can really impact us. Uh, you know, angels in artwork impacts us, right? A lot of people think angels look like this, that cherubs look like that, when in reality, if we follow what the Bible teaches, uh, we see angels that more fit that description. I don't know how well you can see that, but, uh, and just a little note that I I found, I've learned this recently and I thought was interesting, is that angels are always depicted really weirdly like that and stuff in visions only, right? When you read about angels like uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and stuff, they're depicted as humans, normal, normal kind of looking beings. But when we're looking at biblical visions and symbols and stuff, they're always really weird looking. So I thought that was an interesting discrepancy to, n- to note. But or uh, as I mentioned in the sermon a few weeks ago, uh, we tend to think of the forbi- forbidden fruit in Genesis as an apple. Uh, but that's that's not really what it is. Uh, we don't really know. But artists had to pick a fruit to draw the scene and they just picked an apple. And so you know, these things, these, these powerfully, it powerfully affects us, these images that we get from our culture, and it can inf- influence the way we interpret scripture. So some other things that can affect our free understanding is Sunday school, right? What VBS lessons did you get as a kid? That was really hard for me. I had to relearn a lot of Bible stories that I had learned through the lens of children's church, not saying there's anything wrong with children's church, it's just the familiarity of that made me think I knew, I've studied the text, I know the meaning of it. When I, when I looked at it, through the eyes of an adult, it was a lot different. Um, so church plays is another one, Bible studies, hymns and Christian pop music, jokes, uh, non-biblical literature, art. You know, a good, a good illustration of this is from the Bible, uh, is when we think about the story of, or the book of Jonah. So, you know, you try to visualize Jonah inside of a great fish, right? What do you see? Is it something like this image? When you think of Jonah inside a whale, do you think of Jonah inside a stomach that's eight to ten feet wide, a little water at the bottom, right? Uh, But in reality, it most likely looks more like this, right, (laughs) inside of a fish's stomach. Uh, So, you know, where do we get this imagery from? Well, a lot of people think that, like, this imagery imagery with Jonah is from the movie Pinocchio, right? Like, we 
Some of us have watched that, and that impacted us. Some of us have watched Finding Nemo, where they're hanging onto the tongue of the, f- of the whale before they get swallowed, right? And we just imagine this big, open space. And you can see how this, this can affect our interpretation of the text. Before we even have made any proper study, uh, it just kind of, this happens, right? It's like our mind does an image search, and it, it hits a mark with Pinocchio and brings that file up to our mind without us even thinking about it. And we can tend to let that jade the way we interpret Scripture. So, What is culture? Well, culture is an identity, and it's also a combination of family and national heritage. I mean, you learn it from your parents at breakfast, from the kids at the playground at school, from television. It's a mix of language, customs, uh, stories, movies, jokes, literature, and national habits. For Americans, uh, you know, kind of like a snapshot of American culture is, you know, Big Macs, Barbie dolls, Tiger Woods, Lady Gaga, all mixed in with George Washington, Babe Ruth, Mississippi River, Uh, Walmart, Facebook, you know, and if the above statement is true, how will that affect the way we interpret scripture? We have to, how will these things influence? So some things that will affect our cultural perspective is our ethnicity, our social economic status, and our family life. And I just wanted to cover a few of these real quick because I think this is really important of how powerfully this shapes our pre-understanding. So it can vary somewhat even within the same city, right? The culture can. If you grow up in an inner city, blue collar, Catholic home with both of your parents, your culture differs in many respects to someone who grew up in a suburban, white-collar, single-parent, Protestant home. You may still share a lot of the same cultural influences. Uh, However, even though you may share some of these common cultural features, it's important to note that black, white, Asian, Hispanic cultures uh, differ significantly even within North America, right? And once you move out of North America, it's even, you, you, you encounter an even more drastic cultural difference, right? So your family background is also a central element in your cultural world. You have inherited many, many values, ideas, and images for good and for bad from your family. Um, For example, what are your views about money, work, the poor, the unemployed? Your views have undoubtedly been shaped by your family's social economic setting and its outlook. If you're from an upper class middle, uh, if you're from an upper middle class family, you will probably approach biblical texts about money and the poor from a different frame of reference than someone who's in the slums of Haiti, right? And I'm not saying that the ones, the, the viewpoint in the slums of Haiti or America is right. I'm just saying, is automatically right. I'm just saying that as Christians, we have to be aware that in both settings, our family background, our social economic status, these things affect the way we read the scriptures without even realizing it. Your family also provides you with the strongest frame of reference, right, for relationships. If you were fortunate enough to grow up in a home uh, with a loving, caring family, then it's easy for you to kind of transfer that stuff over to uh, the imagery of God's care for you. If you have a loving father, for example, uh, then the biblical image of God as a loving father is very easy for you to grasp. Uh, so in this case, your cultural influence actually helps you, right, grasp the biblical truth. Unfortunately, not everyone has a loving father, right? Those who have grown up in uh, abusive or absent, uh, with absent or abusive fathers, they carry a lot more baggage to these biblical texts. Now, it doesn't mean that they won't be able to grasp this biblical truth, but it does mean that they may, they'll probably have to work harder to overcome some of these negative images from their childhood. So, you know, other images of God and his care may relate to them better. But as we seek to understand God's word, it's important that we, we acknowledge and we identify these cultural influences at work in our heads and hearts. So, and a lot of, again, this, a lot of this happens subconsciously, and it's what we call interpretational reflex. And so this is an automatic transportation of the Bible text into our cultural world. And I did this a lot as a child. Um, when I told you my method before I knew anything about learning to read scripture and stuff like that, I would just open my Bible and point to a random spot, and I would immediately transport that biblical world, what was going on, right in, as if I was reading it in the 21st century, as if it was written to me in the 21st century, right? And that can, that can, be, that can have a lot of damage that goes with that. And so, because uh, we, with this uh, interpretational reflex, we automatically put parameters on a passage of what it can and can't mean, right? So like, for instance, when I said that Jesus says to turn the other cheek, our culture will automatically, it'll make us put a boundary on that verse and say, oh, this, po- this can't possibly mean that if a bad guy hits me once, I'm supposed to let him hit him twice. I'm not saying that's the truth. I'm just saying we eliminate possibilities. We have to at least be prepared to consider that that text may mean that and not let culture trump what scripture teaches. And so uh, an evocative <laughs> example of this is, uh, let's take a cultural look at Romans 13, 1 through 7. So this, this section's targeted primarily at American readers. So if you're not American, please be patient with me. But uh, we're going to go ahead and read 
Romans 13. So, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which, has, which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear this sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath, and wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of the possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. So, with this passage in mind, would it have been wrong for you to participate in the Boston Tea Party of 1773? In a protest of a new tax on tea, American patriots dumped some, tons of someone else's tea into the Boston Harbor. Was that a Christian thing to do? Or suppose you were one of the Minutemen along, uh, Minutemen along the route between Concord and Boston on April 19, 1775. Should a Christian aim, fire, kill the soldiers that represent the government? Does that not conflict with Romans 13? Or per perhaps the larger question should be asked, was the American Revolution undertaken in disobedience to Romans 13? Keep in mind that the revolution was more about economics than religious freedom. Remember, too, that when Paul wrote Romans, the government in Rome was much more oppressive and tyrannical than the British government ever was under King George III. So what do you think? Perhaps I've angered some of you, right? Perhaps you're steamed up about my challenge to the legi legitimacy of the glorious American Revolution. Please forgive me, but that's not, I'm not really concerned about what you think about the revolution. But what I hope you saw was some inner emotional reaction uh, within yourself to a fairly literal and normal reading of the text. Um, if you reacted strongly to our suggestion of Romans 13, ask yourself, why did I react so strongly? And I would suggest that I struck a cultural sensitive nerve, right? You see, the morality of the American rebellion against Britain is never questioned, right, as we grow up. It's always presented as a wonderful and glorious thing. It is tightly intertwined with our hearts with the flag, baseball, mom, apple pie, right? <laughs> Thus, it's become sacred. We place its rightness and any critique of it or challenge uh, we, we place that above the Bible, and any interpretations of Romans 13 that can possibly be legitimate must comply with the respect of the revolution. So you can see how this can be kind, become a problem. I know whenever my professor gave this illustration, I was like, oh, I don't want you talk about America that way. I felt myself like, get like, angry, and I was like, well, it's a very good point. Like, why am I getting so angry? You know, I'm just reading the text and considering things, and it really just shows you just that uh, even, you know, here in America, we have things that... Uh, exert a powerful subconscious influence on us as we read scripture. So uh, we have to remember that we must submit our pre-understanding to the text, placing it under the text rather than over it. So we do have foundational beliefs, though. So while we must let our pre-understanding change each time we study the passage, the foundational beliefs do not change uh, when we read a passage. These foundational beliefs are connected to our overall view of the Bible. And so here's a list of some of these, not all of them, but some of our foundational beliefs. Is the Bible is the word of God. The Bible is trustworthy and true. God has entered into human history, thus the supernatural does occur. The Bible is not contradictory. It is unified, yet diverse. So it's really important that we kind of talked about this before we get into the interpretive journey, because unless we're considering context, unless we are understanding the role of the Holy Spirit plays on interpreting Scripture, unless we understand the dangers of pre-understanding, the interpretive method will fail us in some regards if we don't have those things kind of sorted out. And so we're now going to go into this five-step method of the interpretive journey. And as we go through it the first time, I'm not going to do an example. We're going to do an example at the end. So if this is like information overload as you're getting it, just realize that we're going to be using this method multiple times in the next few weeks. We're going to use it on an example after we go through it once today. And then we're also going to use it on gospels, letters, poetry, and apocalyptic literature in the next few weeks. So if, if, uh, you're, if you're feeling a little unsure about this method, just give it a, give it a few times going through and you'll start to, it'll start to make more sense to you. But I think it's, it's fairly easy to learn. So last week we covered how these approaches would, are not very ideal, right? The intuitive or this just feels right approach, right? Or the spiritualizing approach where everything, we try to find a deep spiritual meaning but we overlook what the author meant. 
or we shrug our shoulders and approach and just, ah, you know, I don't want to study it, you know. So we can see that these things, uh, the, they fail us. Uh, but before we learn, before we jump into the five-step method, let's remember the things we learned last week. We're going to carry these things with us on our journey, on our interpretive journey. So we're going to look for the author's intended meaning. We're going to read the passage in its context. We're going to identify the genre of the passage, consider the historical and cultural background of the Bible, pay attention to the grammar structure within a passage, interpret experience in light of Scripture, not vice versa, and always seek the full counsel of Scripture. So we're going to keep these things with us in mind as we go on this interpretive journey. So here's a snapshot of all the five steps that we're going to learn today. And this is, uh, if you like pictures, here you go. <laughs> uh, so there are five steps on this journey. The first one in the top left is grasping the text in their town. Okay. The second one is measuring the width of the river to cross. You can see the river in the middle of the screen. That's step two. Step three is crossing the principalizing bridge or the universal truth bridge, however you like to say that. Uh, and that's indicated by the bridge there. And then four, consult the biblical map, and five, grasp the text in our town. So uh, remember, we're not looking to create the meaning out of the text, but to find the one that's already there. So let's go with step one. So step one, grasping the text in their town. So a crucial question you're going to ask when you're trying to look at a passage and you're trying to decide this is you're going to ask, what did the text mean to the biblical audience? This question should flush out what the text means in their town. And you're going to complete this step by these following things. The first step is to read the text carefully and observe it. In step one, you try to see as much of the t as possible in the text. Look, look, and look again. Observe all that you can. Scrutinize the grammar. Analyze the significant words. Study the historical and literary context. These things will help your, you understand how this passage relates to uh, their town. So after completing all of the study, you're going to synthesize the meaning of the passage to the biblical audience in one to two sentences. So you're going to kind of you're going to get a summary now. Once you kind of have asked all these questions, you've considered these things, and you're asking what did this text mean to the biblical audience, you're going to try to write out a sentence uh, of a summary of what it meant to the audience. So and use past tense verbs. This will help you uh, when you're referring to the biblical audience. So you're going to try to again sum up that one to two sentences of what this meant to the audience and use past tense verbs. After you have that one to two sentences, then we're going to move to stage two. And stage two is where we, uh, you know, we're separated by a river of differences from the biblical audience. And these differences form that river that hinders us from moving straight from the meaning in their context to ours. So the width of the river can vary from passage to passage. In the New Testament, it can be a little creek that we have to step over, no problem. Uh, in the Old Testament, it can be a really, really big river, right, that's hard to cross. So we're just at this step, we're just kind of looking at how, how big is this river? Like, how much work are we getting into? How much are we going to have to kind of figure out? How many, you know, is there a covenant change? All of these things are good to consider. So, uh, and then things that will help you consider this is, uh, this river of differences is account for the common differences in the culture. Um, so these differences can be culture, language, situation, time. Um, focus on the unique differences found in the specific text. If you're studying an Old Testament passage, you must account for the life and work of Jesus Christ. So that's going to be kind of a, a unique circumstance if you're, if you're working in the Old Testament. So these things should help you kind of figure out the differences, right, the, of that river. And then that's crucial because uh, that's going to lead us into the, the next part, which is by far the hardest in my opinion, and that is crossing the principalization bridge. So what is the theological principle or the universal truth in this text? So even though God is giving theological teachings for his people at a certain time, certain place, there are, uh, there's a universal teaching there that can apply to everyone of all generations, of all time periods. And our job is to find that universal truth because that's going to be crucial. And so step one uh, is, and that's going to be linked to step one. So make sure, uh, how did that relate to the biblical audience? That meaning of the theological truth that you're looking for is going to be connected to what it meant to the audience. And so to complete this step, you're going to recall the differences that you identified in step two. You're going to identify any similarities between the biblical audience and contemporary life. So you're going to look at similarities and differences. And you're going to try to identify a broader theological principle reflected in the text, but also one that kind of accounts for the similarities that we have with the biblical audience. So we're, again, we're going to use this universal truth to cross over these, this river of barriers. And make sure when you're writing out this theological truth that you write it out in present tense verbs. Don't use past tense. Okay, so the theological principle, uh, here's the five criteria that, that makes it. So when you're looking to find out what, the, what is that universal truth in the passage, 
these five areas will help you hone in and, and see if you have a strong universal truth, if you've located it in the passage. And so, number one, it should be reflected in the text, right? If your universal truth is not in the text or a main theme in the text, you might be off base. Um, it has to be timeless, not tied to just one situation. This universal truth for the biblical audience uh, that we're looking at, it, it can't be tied to just them. It has to be one that applies to, to everyone of all time. It can't be culturally bound, so it can't just be in one culture. Uh, correspond to the teaching of the rest of Scripture, so it has to be in harmony with the rest of Scripture. And it needs to be relevant, though, even though it may not be uh, tied specifically to the biblical audience, it needs to be relevant to both them and us. So these five steps, these five criteria will help us flush out the universal truth that we're looking for, okay? Step four gets a little bit easier. So now that we've gotten this universal truth, we're going we're gonna to look at the rest of Scripture. How does this principle fit with the rest of the Bible? Are there certain things uh, in the Bible that add upon this, that build upon this universal truth, or set restrictions on it maybe? That's something that we need to look at. And so this is kind of the step where you just kind of step back and you think really hard about this thing that you've just figured out, this universal truth. Is this something that, that goes against Scripture, or is this something that's echoed in Scripture a lot? And so uh, we believe that the Old Testament is, uh, is part of God's Word to us, and we don't, but we don't want to ignore the cross at the same time, right? Because we don't want to apply the lit to this literature. We don't want to interpret it as if we're Old Testament Hebrews, right? Because we're not Old Testament Hebrews anymore. We affirm that we're New Testament Christians. So we have to apply the Old Testament from that vantage point. So that's a really important thing. I think sometimes people get, you know, really upset saying, oh, you don't believe in the Old Testament, and it's, it's a complete misunderstanding. We do. We just, we have to interpret the Old Testament in light of the New Testament covenant, because we are New Testament Christians. So, uh, Okay, so step four, yeah, okay, I think I just talked about all that. And this brings us to our last step. So this step moves from an abstract principle to a concrete application. We're going to try to figure out how does this universal truth uh, that was specific to the biblical audience, how must we now grapple with it and apply it to our town today? So how does this work out in real-life situations? So even though... Uh, you know, there typically is only one universal truth in the passage. Sometimes there's a few, but most times there's usually just one kind of main theological principle that can be applied to ev all people of all times. Uh, but there's going to be numerous applications. Once you find that, the way that universal truth plays out in our individual lives is going to be very different, right? Because we all have very different scenarios that we're dealing with in our lives. And so the question that you're going to ask for this one is, how should Christians today live out this theological principle that we just found in step three? a few seconds to write anything down, finish your notes, and I'm going really kind of fast, but like I said, uh, you can always rewatch this, or we're going to go hit an example up with this, so it'll become a lot more clear when you see it paired with an example. So to, to kind of show you all those steps in one sitting, here's those five steps, and you can use this literally on any passage in Scripture, and that's what I love about this method, is this method is going to steer you away from so many mistakes uh, that, that other methods don't account for. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to use a text, so if you guys want to uh, turn to Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, we're going we're gonna to use this method on, this five-step method on this passage, and I think it'll become a lot, e you'll be able to see this a lot easier when we look at that. I just realized I don't have the text up here, so you definitely might want to look it up on your phone real quick. It is kind of long. Okay, so let's start reading. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses, his aide, Moses, my servant is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot. As I promised Moses, your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will also be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. 
Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So before we jump into grasping the text into their town, uh, are there any details that you got that jump out of you out at you from the text? Anything that you know just immediately you see and you're like, wow, that seems important, or this seems, you know, make sure you use this time to observe the text before we just immediately jump in, you know. And so, what are some of these? Uh, how, what would this have meant to the biblical audience? You know, what would this passage have meant? So let's look at a few examples. So if you were doing this on your own and you're trying to brainstorm right now, writing down, you know, things that you saw in this passage and of how the biblical audience would have understood it, here's some things you would have taken away from it. One, this is obviously at the t- a very important time, right, at the death of Moses, so it's in a time of transition, okay? That's an important detail to the audience, right? Two, Moses and Joshua, these aren't just regular guys on the street, right? These are divinely sanctioned leaders, so that would have been something the audience would have understood as well and would have been important to them. The Lord said to Joshua, so we've got divine speech, very important to the audience. The Jordan River, Promised Land, these are very important geographical locations they would have recognized. And then in 6 through 9, it seems like we've got a series of exhortations going on here, right? So did you guys notice any words that were repeated in this passage? Because remember, if the author is repeating words, he's probably that's probably a good indicator that something important is going on. Did, so what do you guys, when you were looking at the text earlier, did, you, did anyone notice any repeating words? Yep. So strength and courage, that was in verses 6, 7, and 9. So good, good job. Anybody else see any others? Okay, so we've got presence in verses 5 and 9. Law is mentioned in 7 and 8, and success is mentioned in 7 and 8. So it's just important to kind of, you know, write those down, get those... Uh, repetitive words uh, in there, so we're considering those. Okay, now what we're going to do in step one is we're going to take that big chunk of text, and we're going to try to summarize in one to two sentences using past tense verbs, what does this mean to the biblical audience? So if you're watching this online, this would be a time where you just pause it, you kind of think a bit, try to come up with something, uh, your summary, and try to see if it matches with what I'm about to read. Okay, so this is kind of, you should have something like this when you, when you do your summary of what this passage would have meant to the audience. The Lord commanded Joshua, the new leader of Israel, to draw strength and courage from God's empowering presence, to be obedient to the law of Moses, and to meditate on the law so that he would be successful in the conquest of the promised land. Okay, so that's a good little summary of, of what uh, that text was talking about to the, to the audience, right? Now, we're going to move to step two now that we have that little summary, and we're going to measure the river to cross. So... What are, oops, what are some differences from this time period to ours that, that we immediately recognize in the text? When we're looking at that river of differences, what are, what are some differences in this passage? Yeah, very good. So we are not setting out on a conquest on the promised land, right? That's a definitely a difference. Good job. Um, so yeah, if you're sitting here jotting down some more, some other ones that you may have come up with are we are not the leaders of the nation of Israel, right? So that's a definitely a big difference. And we are not under the old covenant law anymore, okay? Another big difference that we always want to make note of. So what are s- some similarities, though, that we have in common with the biblical audience? Good one. So God is present with us. Definitely still applicable to, to our time period as well, right? Some other ones, if you were thinking of similarities that you might have come up with, is God has a calling on the life of each person. So that's something that we have in common with the biblical audience and what's going on in the passage. And we also, God's word requires obedience, right? We definitely understand that. So now that we've got some similarities and differences, we're going to try to come up with this universal principle, okay? 
And remember, this is going to be connected to the meaning we discovered in step one, that summary that I gave you of what, what the, it meant to the biblical audience, because we're looking to use that as a launch pad into our town, right? We want to look at that, what it meant to the audience, and try to figure out what is that universal truth in there that even though we can throw culture, time, covenant changes, everything out the window, but this still remains. This point can still be applied to us. And so there's usually only one... Uh, So, this is what you should have come up with if you were trying to figure it out on your own, is to be effective in serving God uh, and successful in the task to which he has called us, we must draw strength and courage from his presence. We must also be obedient to God's word, meditating on it constantly. So this is the universal truth that we can get from this passage. These things apply to all Christians, all people everywhere. Um, and even though that text, there were a lot of differences, right, that we were working through. That was not an easy text. If you were reading that one and you were trying to come up with the theological principle and you had no method, it would be really difficult to kind of flush out the meaning there. But these steps have led us to this kind of universal truth. Now that we have this universal truth, you know, we need to see, does this f universal truth that we just found, which is right here, does that fit with the rest of Scripture? Is there anything in Scripture that forbids that or contradicts it or adds to it? Well, whenever we take that statement up there and we look at the rest of Scripture, what we see is that, yes, the whole of Scripture affirms that God's people can draw strength and courage from His presence. But there is a little bit of difference to note in the New Testament, right? The Holy Spirit mediates God's presence to His people, okay? So it's not through a temple or through an ark or anything like that. And also, in both the Old and New Testament, God's people are uh, ex uh, encouraged to mediate on Scripture, right? To meditate on Scripture, sorry. So now that we've consulted the biblical map, we're now ready to jump into our town. What does this text now mean to us? What can we do with this universal truth that we've discovered? How is this relevant to our lives, right? And so uh, here are some applications. Uh, just There's obviously more. There can be hundreds of them, right? Uh, but some of these applications to that, that universal truth we discovered is we need to spend more time meditating on God's word. And how can we do that? Well, we can by listening to Christian music in your car is one way. Another one is if God calls you to a new scary mini uh, ministry, be strengthened and encouraged by his presence. That's something that we can definitely apply. And then another one, uh, if you're in church leadership position, realize that successful Christian leadership requires strength and courage that flows from the presence of God. So you see, we, we were able to take that kind of difficult passage and draw some universal truths into our own context, right? And that was that five-step method allowed us to do that fairly quickly. I know it was kind of a lot of info, and maybe it'll take you a, a, a few times through to kind of get the hang of, grasping it in their town and, and formulating that universal truth. But as you follow this method, I'm almost pretty sure that if you just pick a passage and just start practic practicing this method, you'll start to see this works really well. Like this, this really enables me to get the meaning of the text and, and apply it to my life. And so the interpretive journey is a consistent method that you can use on all genres. So next week we're going to use this five-step method. We're going to show you how to use it on the Gospels and on the New Testament letters. It's like the whole New Testament right there, right? <laughs> and then the week after that, uh, we are going to study poetry and uh, the genre of apocalyptic literature and kind of figure out how does this method, can this method work with Revelation? And I think you're going to be surprised and enlightened to find out that it, uh, that it can. And so uh, with that, um, do we have any questions over the material today before we close out in prayer? Yeah, and uh, one of the things that if you buy the book, that this, the Grasping God's Word, third edition, it'll actually cover the translation parts and how that kind of plays into it. But it does, uh, it d each translation has kind of a goal, right, that they're trying to get through. And that goal can be good, can be bad sometimes, depending on the text that you're studying. But yeah, there is differences, like for instance, in different translations, they will group the chapters and the verse numbers differently. So you may go study the lost coin, the parable of the lost coin, and the King James Version may group it completely differently uh, than another version. And that's because the chapters and the verse headings, those aren't inspired by the Holy Spirit. Those are, there's flexibility on those. You kind of have to read the passage and figure out, you know, which translation do I think really breaks it up the right way? You know what I mean? And so that's where I think it mainly comes into play, that and maybe some of the word choices. So, uh, but again, you can always take it to the original Greek, the original Hebrew, you know, and so I think that that's always interesting to me is that you get cer certain people that are very passionate about the King James Version. You know, it's the only version. But, 
you know, it was written in Greek and Hebrew. So if there was going to be only one version, it would be the original language, right? It wouldn't be the 16th century English translation that we don't even speak in anymore. You know, we don't say thou and thou shall not and, ha, you know, all those different old English words. We just don't speak that way anymore. Uh, and the new K- King James Version has kind of edited that and changed it to make it more relatable. But yeah, great question. So are there any other questions? So did you guys think that this method was somewhat easy? I've, I mean, I know that you have other methods out there that you've used. This one, I think, really encompasses uh, just all the, the pitfalls that Christians tend to fall in, mainly when it comes to stepping outside of what the author maybe meant and you know, not considering those things. And I think this method, like I said, it's great that it comes with pictures. <laughs> you know, like I love that. that I, I literally pretend every time I'm, I'm translating scripture or I'm interpreting scripture that I'm going on a journey. You know, and I don't want any of that cultural baggage with me. I don't want my pre-understanding. Um, I know that I can't be completely objective 100%, right? That's not the goal, is to, like, just be completely objective, because we can't. Our culture is still part of us. But we do want to be aware of those big red flag moments where we're maybe seeing this the wrong way. So, yeah, go ahead. Yep, and it's definitely better than my method, right? Just opening somewhere and just pointing somewhere. <laughs> and so uh, hopefully you find this method easy. Uh, if, if not, if you have more questions, like I said, just start practicing this method out on different passages and it'll start to become a lot more clear. Um, but you'll get more hang of this as you come back in the next few weeks because we're going to be using it more. So, Okay, well, let's pray real quick then. Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, we just lift up uh, your word. We want to treat it well, Lord. We want to handle your words wisely. Lord, I just pray that you can be with these uh, believers here in this room today as they continue through this journey uh, that not many Christians take, you know, of, of how to handle your God, how to handle your words better, how to interpret them better. And Lord, I just pray that you can give us grace, give us humility, uh, let us preach from a point of just wanting to figure out how we can understand you better, not from a place that where we can use this as a hammer or uh, with arrogance, Lord. I just pray that, again, we can just take this information uh, just to the, our families, to the, to the workforce, to everywhere, anyone who wants to listen and wants to know how to better interpret your word. It's in your son's name that we pray these things. Amen.